we how can an organization do to to build its brand in the local environment, national environment, and international environment? That's a really, you know, this is a good point. In thinking, this goes back to the target audience. Remember, I said, who's the niche? Who you, you know, do you, who do you want to affect? Content, international. Bring in somebody from Great Britain into the into the content. That's sort of how I would have to approach it. Um, I'd also like to make a disclaimer. I don't know how advanced you are or not advanced, I'm, so I'm not sure, but I'm gonna try to start with some basics and build it step by step for you, okay? So if you know a lot of this, please play along. I'm hoping that a lot of this will be pertinent from building from where you are today to where you need to go, okay? So I'd suggest this, marketing and communication, that's my topic. You got to define your brand. Your brand is everything, it's the foundation. And everything comes out of that brand because without that brand, you don't have a consistent image or a consistent message, okay? So many times if you look at the branding, people say, why, what's the purpose? Okay, why do I need that? Um, oh, by the way, let me stop. When we're done, this PowerPoint's gonna be available in my blog. Okay, so you'll have this. So if you don't frantically write, if you don't want to, you'll get all this. Um, it's about recognition. Okay, who are you? What are you about? And sometimes we don't have much time to represent that to people. Who we are, what's our brand? That has to happen pretty quickly. And differentiation. I'm sure you've heard in the marketplace, unique selling proposition. Okay, what makes me different from others? Okay, and with the brand, we have to talk about awareness, who knows about us, and who do we want to know about us? And I'm gonna to talk toward the end about some of the latest in lead generation and conversion, okay? Because I would suggest, help me out here, is it not about revenue? The most, all of you need revenue. You need more resources. Uh, I know in the past, speaking to Mandela Fellows, you're all passionate. You all have immediate needs, but many times it's about the money that you need to, to accomplish things. So I'd suggest if you want to be motivated, think about that brand development will take you to the revenue generation part. Okay, so that, that to me is the end result for most, okay? So when you build a brand, that helps you understand how you will promote your organization. And this is difficult. Many times people jump ahead. And I'll talk to you in a few seconds about how that happens. A lot of people, a lot of messages, uh, social media. But if you don't know the brand and you can't communicate that brand identity to your stakeholders, employees, volunteers, etc., the message becomes fragmented, many times possibly negative. Okay, so the brand helps you promote your organization. It's one before the other, okay? Unique selling proposition, I, you know, I thought about that earlier. Uh, the two big things in advertising, and I always go back to this, is unique selling proposition. What is it about you that matters? What makes you important to others? Why is your, uh, your passion important to other people? Why should they support it? Okay, and with unique selling proposition, the other one is always call to action. What do you want people to do? Many, many times in our messaging, we miss the call to action. We don't ask people, I want you to respond to this. Click through to my landing page. Um, so think of that always and, and think of that now. What's your unique selling proposition? And then we'll get to call to action, okay? So that's a great way to start. And then I already hit, sometimes I apologize, I rehearsed this so I talk ahead a little bit on the slides. This is just to sort of cue my memory of what I'm talking about. So remember USP and CTA, two big pieces of your branding. Many times people say, well, I don't know where to start. Where do I, what do I do with my brand? But if you think of unique selling proposition and call to action, it's a way to help have that conversation start, okay? Think of this prototypically. Here's another helper on your brand. If your brand was a person, how would you describe that individual and their traits? 
Picture your organization or your brand as a person. Are they very stoic and serious? Are they very friendly and approaching? Are their arms crossed? Are they open? What does that person look like? How do they interact? Right? What's the face of that per or faces? If you're inclusive, what are the different faces of that group? Right? But if you put a lot of times a brand into personal values, it helps you understand how you want other people to perceive. And I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Okay? All right. So when you humanize the brand, think about all the pieces and parts. And these are sort of the, the, the um, uh, a menu of things you would want to think about in your org. Now, you all right, might already have a logo. Maybe you've designed it. You like it. But a logo is very important. That carries that prototypical you know, branding that demonstrates who you are. The colors you use. Maybe you thought that through before. Maybe you haven't. But, you know, you can check on this. Different colors are subliminally, they, they subliminally affect people in different ways. So think about the colors you use. Are they hot colors? Are they cool colors? That's important, okay? And then the images you use, I'll give you an example of that. We'll look at some images that are tied to your brand. And then we'll talk a little bit more as I go on about video. Little short video segments are becoming very, very important in messaging and marketing. So what does that look like? Take it back to the brand, always back to the brand. Okay? All right, thank you. Here's why it's so important, and I keep reiterating and selling this message to you. Why is it so important to build a brand? You've got to build leads that lead to conversion to sustain function. So, I mean, you find people, I would say, are they benefactors? Are they people who contribute grants? Are they people who give you in-kind services? I'm gonna talk in a second about in-kind. Is it volunteer help that gives you labor to run your organization? Brand building brings you to the right people so you can convert them to the place you need to go. Okay. That's how, if I look at it now and the more I'm studying lately, the biggest business is good about social media. There's a lot of content we need to do that. But I'll show you some tools later that are much more specific to lead generation and conversion. That seems to be the new model because people want to get to the business. Okay? So think about that. Okay? So here is also important. So you do all this work, and I know it's a process, and it takes time. But when you have that brand image and the communication is consistent with that brand, you will develop trust. People will start trusting your organization. They will see it as legitimate. They will start becoming passionate about your passions. And with trust comes perceived value, right? In, in uh, nonprofit fundraising, you might have heard we talk about the big ask. You want someone to give $10,000, $25,000 for your cause. You've got to get to the trust and value part before you go for the big ask. Okay, so this is all a development of where you get to the place you get that big lead. Uh, it's the, you know, the corporate HR person who has seen you, has seen that, believes in you. Then you get to the point where you can ask for those kind of funds. Okay, so this is the process of the brand building. Okay. Employees and volunteers. It's important for that. They need to see a really clean professional image. Enthusiastic donors. People that want to come, you know, you might have heard of push and pull marketing. You know, push marketing is we blast messages out at everybody and hope something happens. Pull messaging is when people opt into us. They want to become part of what we do. They follow us on the social media. They engage with comments. Those become enthusiastic donors. You're no longer begging for money, you know, pleading for money. People have engaged your brand, so they become more enthusiastic about giving to you. Okay? So these are all reasons why brand building is important. Okay? And then I mentioned earlier in-kind partnerships, and I'm going to give you examples. Many times you want money. But you need other things than money. And I'm going to show you some things coming up that require subscription fees. 
well, maybe a benefactor will help you pay for a subscription fee for a tool you need to do more business. Or a benef uh, in-kind partner may give you some simple video equipment so you can make these Instagram videos we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, they'll give you product. They'll give you services. They might help you with uh, labor. They might contribute workers. So never disallow the fact in-kind partnerships are very valuable. You just have to think about when you need them and how to, how to ask for that, okay? So branding, again, brings you closer to in-kind partnerships, okay? And one last thing about good branding is grant applications. I don't know how many of you are pursuing grants, but believe me, if you're getting down and you're a finalist for a grant application, they are going to look at you. They will go out, they will check your social media, they're gonna look at your imaging, they're gonna look at your branding, they're gonna look at your content threads because they wanna know who you are if you are being considered for a large grant. If your branding's in place, your messaging's consistent, that will help you in the consideration of who gets the grant. And we all know grant uh, grants are competitive, really competitive. So these are more reasons to get the branding in place and make it look good. All right? More reasons. Okay. There's a problem, and I'm going to tell you about that. You probably know this. You might do your best job, get the branding where you want it to be, consistent communication, but it's hard because you want to affect your stakeholders and make sure they get that good message. In a social media context, it can be difficult. It's the haters, people who jump on a post of yours and post negative things people that say things that aren't true. So I'm, I'm being honest here. We want to build a brand and control a brand pre-internet that was really easy to do. It really was. There were so few channels of communication. You knew where you could advertise and it was easy to control your message and brand. Now with social media, that can get a bit clouded depending on who's posting where and doing what. Okay. So I'd suggest, and I'll make some comments here with your brand, Make sure you're affecting in the best way the people you can control. And I will show you and give you an example of a way I think you can do that. Okay. How does it translate across platforms? Remember in social media, platforms are templates. They're given to you as different things, right? That you don't control a lot of times how social media platforms lay out. You have to fit into their template. Okay. How does it transition? How does it work? Well, let's look at UNICEF. I have no tie to UNICEF. I just pulled this up as an example. Okay. So here is UNICEF, and I'm looking at this. I believe this is their Facebook page. So we see the logo. It's a light sans serif type, white reversed out in a sky blue with their uh, small UNICEF logo set in. Right or wrong, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that is their brand. That's what they want to look like. But look what was more important here. Two other big factors. Their tagline. For every child, comma, every right. And if you've noticed, they've popped, they've reversed right out the word right. They've reversed it. That's a little bit of emphasis in their design. And then look at the image. Now, what's happened here when they're allowed to play, you know, you get to put one primary image in on your Facebook page, your, your business or community page. They chose this image. And of course, you've got to be in the right dimensions. You have to be certain dimensionally. This is a horizontal. But they went ahead and put that tagline embedded in the image. So when the image loaded, the tagline was in it. Does that make sense? So if you choose to have a tagline or a positioning statement, build that into the image that you want to load into your social media. Okay. When you look at UNICEF now as an individual, remember prototypically, what is that person? What's UNICEF? What do you see in the faces of these children? Okay. How are things going there? How do you feel about that organization? That is an, it is an effort to build a certain brand perception. Okay, so think about your image. What do you want to place? Now, if you look down here, they're at 7.6 uh, million people following. So huge following, 
And this is how it looks here. Now, how about this? Uh, this is, I believe, let me get my glasses back on. I believe this is Twitter. So how are we doing here? Look what Twitter allows. Do you see the consistency? The picture is cropped differently because you're given different dimensions on Twitter. You don't get the same space, but look how they cropped it. They kept the same image, but based on this, they went in closer. Can you see that? Look how it's cropped here. And now look at how they do it here. Same type brand message. They've just used the same image in a little different cropping. Still embedded their uh, tagline, right? So do you see here how this is you know, holding up as consistent? Okay, and they have 7.6 million followers here also. Okay, so how about those two? I'd suggest the brand image is fairly consistent with what you're given. Okay, remember here, by the way, logo and circle, logo and circle. Look what happens here. What happened with LinkedIn? All of a sudden, not your choice, I believe. You're forced, the logo goes in the square. That's important, but you might not control that. You know, is your logo, is your logo in a round? Is your logo in a square? These are all considerations. On social, you may not get that choice. Here, same logo, but in a square box. Why didn't they keep the same picture? Why? I don't know. I'm not saying that's wrong. I would say this. LinkedIn is going to be mostly for more your business to business community, while the other two platforms are business to consumer communities. Doesn't make it wrong, but this is a little bit different message. And if you noticed, the tagline is gone out of the image. That's their choice. They could have embedded it, but didn't. But underneath, they have UNICEF saves children's lives, defends their rights, and helps them fulfill their potential. All right? Up here, we have for every child, every right. I would have kept it consistent. I would have kept the same image cropped really tight. That's a choice. But does that make sense to you? Just understanding as your image and brand goes across different platforms, how do you want it to look and how consistent will it be? Okay, so again, this is their LinkedIn page and I'm trying to see here um, what their following is on this. I think 1.2 million followers on LinkedIn. So they're still huge, you know, and that's really, really big for LinkedIn, which is more business related. So again, here we go, imaging here and branding, imaging here and branding, imaging here and branding, okay? That's your challenge. As you go through your brand and your organization, think of these settings and start with that. Think about how are we gonna look across the platforms, okay? And then here is Instagram, takes you to a whole different place. We're back to a circle logo, that's okay. 3.7 million followers here, but see, you with UNICEF, uh, I'm sorry, with, with Instagram, you get a small, real limited amount of information you can put in what they call a bio. And um, that's in here, but look, at it's much more open. There isn't the predominant image. And of course, then down here, you start exhibiting the images you have posted, okay? So sometimes you will not have all the control. If you've noticed, again, I'm backing up. These other ones are fairly similar in layout. But when you get to Instagram, it's a little bit different. The one thing that's been kept consistent is the logo, right? Even though it's in a square here, in these other ones, the logo is allowed to be in a circle. So continuity there, okay? Once again here, um, I don't know about that tagline. That isn't clear when you look at their, you know, basically the page where they, they show their brand. So these are just things you can think about. Tagline, primary image, and logo. Okay, here's another quick point. Leaders and lead volunteers are seen as a sub-brand of the organization. I'm not advocating here for any of you to try to control the social media of people you work with or work for you. I wouldn't say that. But just beware that if the predominant leaders represent themselves in a certain way, that will bleed over into the brand perception. Bad or good, I don't know, but it could be detrimental, might be good. Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon, 
one of the richest men in the world. Look at his Instagram. What does he choose to use? Picture of himself as a young kid, maybe 14 years old. Is that bad? I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying here's how a very, very powerful industrial man in the U.S. represents himself with a picture of him as a kid. How do you want to represent yourselves? Again, you might want to have that discussion, and I'm going to talk with you in a second about how you might want to talk to others in your organization about social media, but just be aware of that, and I think it's a conversation you should have about how leaders present their social media. Okay, just so that's aware, because again, we talked about how the brand is, you know, how you control your brand message, issues with leadership, maybe with a different type of message can affect. Okay, so you've developed your brand identity. Sounds simple, right? But we just talked through the basics of building that brand out. Maybe you have it, if you have it, test your branding against these stages. Is it okay? If you haven't done this, start now, okay? Then you can start building the social content through your brand personality. Once you have the other part in place, you start with content. Here's something I'd suggest to you. I don't know if you use Hootsuite, it is called a social uh, medium, a social media dashboard. Okay, it's a place where you run everything if you're doing your social media, the content, when it goes out, what time it goes out, what platform it goes on to. All your analytics are in one place, showing you who's looking at your stuff, what you're doing. Okay, just think of this, and I'll give you a, a, an example of something right now in a second that's free that you could do with Hootsuite, okay? I just a week or two ago talked to a social media manager in Sydney, Australia. One of her clients wants one tweet every 25 minutes, one Twitter tweet every 25 minutes, nonstop, okay? How in the world does she do that? Well, you know what she does? She sits down with a one or two hour block of time on a given day and crafts 50, 60, she crafts all kinds of tweets, loads them into Hootsuite, tells Hootsuite the distribution times. So you see the point here, you don't have time to mess around with social media. That's half the problem with our business model is we spend too much time on social media. Hootsuite is a tool where you can manage it when you have time and then it automates it out for you, okay? So Hootsuite's a good product and we'll get to that in a second. Here again, there's some costs. If you know, this is US, but $29 a month US to use the professional model. And I believe that's good enough. You know, 10 social profiles, you could be running 10 different social media accounts, um, but with one user. You might have one person allocated in your organization to use this and do the social media. Here is one example of in kind. If you don't have the money, you maybe don't want to spend $30 a month find a partner or a benefactor, you can go to them and say, look, help us to help ourselves. We want you to help. All we want to ask you to do is fund our Hootsuite so that we can do better social media marketing. So find a partner to fund it for you. These are in-kind asks, right? You're showing people what you're doing with the money. And sometimes people say, this makes sense. I can see where the money's going. So why not ask somebody to fund your Hootsuite for the next three years? as one contribution, okay? Just an idea, because again, there's some cost to running Hootsuite, but this link will be in your presentation. There's a really great free social marketing training course. Matter of fact, I'm using it in a fall class. I'm teaching social media strategies in the fall. I'm gonna use this. It's a great little intro, okay? And again, this link will be back in the PowerPoint I give you, you can click in, but Here's what you do, you sign up free, you go in, it's simple. There's little five minute videos and then little three or five question quizzes. If you get a wrong answer, it takes you back and you get the right answer. It's real basic, but here's the six parts of that training. Overview of the social platforms, what are they? Optimize profiles, I'm not talking about that a lot this session, but how do you make the best social media profile? Strategies, just we're talking about brand strategies. It's got a little section on that. Building advocate communities, that's what you want. You want communities of people that share like-minded passions. So it teaches that. 
leveraging content. That's what we all, that's where all, we leverage our content to get results. And then intro to paid. I'll talk just a little bit about paid social. Easy little steps, six parts, not hard to do. And it's free. And by the end, of, when you finish, a little certified, you know, a certification pops up on the screen that you have finished this little Hootsuite social training. Okay, here's what I'd suggest. It's free. You could require it for employees. If employees are going to be doing anything with your social media, require them to take this course. You could even use this course and host sessions for volunteers. I don't know what your volunteer base looks like, or you could tell volunteers, if you're going to be part of us in social media, we want you to take the Hootsuite course. Real simple. If you finish it, just take a screenshot of the certification and send me the screenshot that you took it. That's what I do with my students. Okay, so it's a tool, it's free, great intro, and I would suggest there's something you can use to build that part of your business. Okay, okay, where do we start with the content? So we're, we're, we've got the brand thing going, right? We've worked on our brand. We've looked a little bit at introductory training for social media. Now, where do we go? Where do we do with our content? Okay, develop themes that are advantageous to your development. So think about themes of writing. I think too often in social, we've become reactive. Here's a picture of my meal today. Here I am on a bridge. Look at me with my sister. I'm riding a bicycle. That social media has become reactive, but think strategically as a business, what are some themes you wanna write about? What are some themes, okay? And I'm going to talk in a minute about a 30-day plan. I always suggest maybe you want to build a 30-day media plan. Maybe that's four themes. That would be one a week. Okay? Themes. Maybe it's, you know, uh, better, better reading skills for uh, children in grade school. Um, you know, how do we best engage inclusiveness in our organization? Just think of themes. And when you have a theme that's good for you and you're passionate about it, then you can build social media against that. Okay, start with the themes. Okay, think of people in your niche. Who are you writing to? In advertising, we talk about who's the target audience. Okay, who do you want to read this? Is it a top executive that makes decisions in HR with budgeting? Is it a volunteer? Maybe one theme is effective for one certain target audience. It's not going to be the same. You know, if you're, uh, we talk a lot in the, and I'll talk in a second, influencers. You're always trying to reach social influencers. That's one type of theme versus someone who might want to be a first time volunteer. Okay. So just think about that when you think about your themes. And here's where I'm going to get this is something I've been working on a lot. Think more about other than yourself. There's so much power in reflecting and writing about powerful people. Who do you emulate? Who do you admire? Research them and find out what are they doing? What are they passionate about? Okay, how might that work? So if you reflect on others and then bring that back to your own theme, you'll get more traffic. Okay, here's a book I'm using. You can buy this used. I mean, it's a simple little book. I use this in my class and I mentioned here, who is that other you're gonna write about? That's an influencer. This book, Social Selling by Hughes and Reynolds, I don't know how it works for you internationally, but you can buy this on eBay used. You can buy digital versions online. It's a real simple read, but Hughes is really big on leveraging influencers. Okay, matter of, I'm teaching a summer class right now, selling through social media, and we use this text. Fast read, simple read, it's not academic but it shows you what the power of an influencer is to your business, okay? So that's just a suggestion, okay? And I'm gonna try to click out. If you went to um, my, my block for this lecture, I gave you two links there. And I try to blog about these type of things on LinkedIn. It seems to me LinkedIn is a good place where I write about these things. And if you look at this, I wrote a piece, and that, that link is available to you, about convincing influencers you're worth the connection. Okay. So 
it's if you find somebody, I don't know, let's say it's some internationally recognized individual, you can't just start in social media plugging in their username and handle. That's not the best way to do it. It's to read about them and think about what do you know about them? What's important? Okay. And let me see if I can go up here and find this. I think. This is, I'm trying to actually toggle to that actual one. This is the one I wrote right here, and I've just toggled into it. But if you want to read down into this, this I wrote about one of my communication courses. But if you go down here, I give you the steps to reaching out and finding and connecting with influencers, okay? Most of the time, it's about some simple research that tells you about what they're up to. A lot of times if you use Google search, click the news tab, search for them in the news, search for their company in the news, and you will find information about these individuals that will help you reflect on them when you write, okay? Takes a little work and it might seem a little roundabout, but that will allow you to bring them into your conversation, okay? That's affecting an influencer. Okay, right? Here's one other thing. If you noticed, this is sort of a weird pick, isn't it? It's a rights-free image. Many times, if you have your own images that you took or someone at your organization allows you to have, that's fine. But of course, we know in good social media, we can't use images we don't have the rights to, okay? Here's a site I'd suggest, Pixabay, if you're ever interested. Pixabay has thousands of free images. So if I'm gonna do a blog post and I wanna write about this, I really don't have an image that I have a rights to, so I go back here, that's a Pixabay image and I gave them credit. Sort of a weird little picture, but it, it's attention getting. So Pixabay, that's a place you can get free images if you want them, rights free, which means no one's gonna say, hey, that's my picture, you, you shouldn't have used it. So I go there quite a bit, okay? And then I wrote another story, and I've termed this social flattery. And I don't necessarily think social flattery is a bad thing, but when we write about influencers and demonstrate we're interested in what they do, I think that's a good thing. So you can use social flattery to bring, and if an influencer likes you and likes what you're writing, they'll start following you, or they may even do social media and call out your organization to others, okay? So let me click into this, I think I can find it. Here is that actual story. And I actually wrote this thinking about the Mandela Fellows. I was thinking about you and what you do. And so I tried to give an example in this about how I did it. And again, this is just at random. I really didn't have a potential reason, but I, I found this, the Against Malaria Foundation, and I put a hot link in my article. Just found it. I thought, interesting. Basically, this organization claims 100% back to the cause, and it's about mosquito netting, to get mosquito netting to the right places, okay? I read into that. I found out, well, here's the, the one of the main players behind that is Peter Sherratt, executive chairman of it, original founder in 2004. He's a legal barrister, legal person, highly successful, okay? I look further. What's his passion? Long distance swimming. He swam from England to France in 12 hours. I'm getting down into the person. I'm trying to understand the passion behind the person, okay? So that I'm thinking, well, here's Peter. He runs this huge organization. Maybe I'm just thinking, would you like to mentor with somebody like Peter? Would Peter be someone you'd like to connect with and maybe discuss running nonprofits? It's just an example. But after that, I went down and found, you want to read more about Peter and how he loves his swimming? Here's a hot link to his personal blog about his swimming endeavors. So here's the point in this whole story. If you're able to go in and find individuals that you're interested in, and take that extra 15, 20 minutes and go a couple layers deeper, you can find the passions of people. And that might be part of your theming. 
If you're passionate about something, you would say, for example, our organization is well aligned with the passions of Peter Sherratt, the long distance swimmer, who by the way, started the Against Malaria Foundation. So you weave these individuals into your writing. And when you're in social media, you use their user IDs, right? They have at their name or whatever their official name is. And then you will traffic into their social media flow. When you use your name, you're gonna get in front of people that follow that influencer. This is all part of connecting and affiliating your brand with influencers, okay? So these are just ideas of when you think of themes, how do you go about reaching out to the other, going a little further and bringing people into what you're writing about. Never lose sight of your own brand. Never lose sight of the fact you're there to build your brand and build your revenues. But bringing in this type of, this type of thinking, this type of writing, puts you in front of completely different audiences and bigger audiences, okay? All right, so I call this feature length social content, feature length maybe five, 700 words. Like my blogs, they're not long, why? No one reads long anymore, no one does. But if it's well written and concise, you can make a point. So think about writing and social content. I think when you write this one week theme plan, it should be anchored by a blog post. That's where you really explain your ideas behind the theme. It could also be the place you link into an influencer, okay? Then after you get your LinkedIn or your, LinkedIn's fine, you post it there, then share the same blog post, copy and paste, that should go to your organizational website. Um, I don't know where you're all at with your websites, what you have. Most of the platforms we use like Wix or other have a blog feature, just turn it on. If you don't use it now, turn it on in your website Make sure you're featuring this. You don't have to rewrite anything. The blog can go on LinkedIn. Then the same blog post goes on um, uh, your personal, your company website. Then it can go on your Facebook company community page. Does this make sense? You share it. Now, if you're using Hootsuite, I believe you can load this to do it for you. But you could, I sometimes I do it manually. I just copy and paste across different blog platforms but share it everywhere and then uh, use your social platforms to tell people about it. On Instagram, a picture. I just wrote about the most important reason we have to educate children. See our blog post. You, Twitter tweets. Tell people and direct them to the link where the blog post is. So my point is here, when you think of that weekly theme, start with a blog post, but then leverage that and cross promote it across all the other social platforms. The one week plan can be just that. Is it posted here, then it's posted here? How many times do you wanna tweet about it that week? Do you wanna do some five different Instagram posts about it that week? Supporting the blog content seems to be a good way to go. And if you do that four times, that would be a 30 day plan for your organization. This is not, it just takes time. It takes diligence and planning but this would be how to be competitive in a social context, okay? Um, I will tell you about one option. I use it a lot. I don't know if it's the best. If you post on Instagram, and you may know this, you can click and opt in to Facebook and Twitter. So when I go out on Instagram, it automatically goes on my Facebook page, it automatically tweets. That's not the, really the best way to do it. You can imagine what I write on Instagram, that isn't a good tweet. That tweet should really be crafted differently specific to Twitter. There's different ways of writing, okay? But for automation purposes, this is a fast way to get information out. So even if you were doing this, if you were calling out one of your blog posts, you might wanna say on an Instagram post, here's what's new, here's our new blog post, and then that would automatically go to Facebook and Twitter. That option exists. You may be using it, if not, you can see that in the post part of Instagram. Okay, there is auto post there, okay? I said this earlier, target the individual you're, you're writing about. Always use their ad handle, like if, if they're on um, uh, Instagram or they're, if they have a username on Instagram or they have an at name that might be used in Twitter, always use that because if you use the influencer's identity name, 
that's what makes it traffic into their audience. Okay, the same with um, hashtags, you may know about that, okay? Hashtags are big search engine opportunities, okay? And what's relevant? Well, here's just one. If you look at top-hashtag.com, you can run any, any word or theme you want. It will give you the top hashtags, okay? For instance, the top hashtag when I pulled this was hashtag love. Love has 1.22 billion posts on social. So if you write, there's nothing more important than the love hashtag of children, you've trafficked into the biggest hashtag, right? So you can think about different themes, different words. Using them credibly will bring you more traffic because people are looking for those search terms. So again, influencer user identities and hashtags are very important when you embed into your social. Okay, all right. There's also a function uh, with Instagram. It's called quiz stickers. Here's my point here. Always leave your readers with a question. Remember call to action? We want them to do something. Ask a question to your blogs. What, would, what was your biggest experience with your passion in this area? Or like I said here with Instagram, there's a quiz function. You might ask them of these three choices, which makes you most passionate about children's education? Do you see my point here? It's the, it's the response mechanism. So if you ask questions in your social posts or you run a quiz function, there's a higher chance. And once you get people to respond, you've got that higher engagement. You want people to respond, okay? I've been guilty of that too many times. I don't have a good call to action. It's common, but think about that and always give people a reason to respond, okay? All right, what else can we do to tell our stories? Instagram TV, have you heard of this? You know, Instagram video is very, very hot right now. A lot of people, a lot of traffic, a lot of people are looking at it. It's sort of Instagram's version of YouTube. So YouTube can be part of it too, okay? but people are going short, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. But how do you tell that visual and audio story that complements your other social media? I'd suggest we consider that. I'm learning to do it myself. I never stop trying to teach myself or learn from others, okay? So remember this, here's a challenge. Most all video is in a horizontal form, right? Instagram is only vertical. Instagram doesn't flip to horizontal. So I've seen things already where I've seen, well, the video's cut and I'm only seeing the, the center third and I don't know what's going on. So you've got to start thinking about what things look like visually vertical. It's just a challenge, but that's part of the Instagram model. Okay, so we think about it. Now, I'm learning and I'm very thankful. Um, this last year, my department, I usually don't ask for much from technical or you know equipment, they bought me a GoPro Hero 7 Black, which is the newest GoPro. It's a tiny little camera. You may have heard of these. It's used a lot in action photography. It's, it's a couple inches big. It's very tiny. Pretty darn good video and audio, okay? I'm using this to learn how to do my video, and then I'm also using what they call a gimbal stick. You might have heard of these. By the way, this is, again, back to getting an in-kind sponsor. Maybe someone would sponsor you on this equipment. I think in US, the Hero 7 Black's about 350 or 300. The gimbal stick's about $75. The gimbal stick, you can see where you mount the GoPro, and however you move it like this, it's always stable. So let's say you're walking along next to somebody interviewing them. There's a teacher walking with 10 children, and you're interviewing them walking. The gimbal stick keeps it real steady. You don't get this jumpy look, right? It's a, it's a quick way to make yourself look professional. So all I'm suggesting here is as I learn, I'm trying to take my little Hero 7 Black and my gimbal stick and start to do these videos so I can have better video content, okay? So maybe find an in-kind sponsor to help with that. But that's really an important component of it, okay? We talked about this. Think about that one month plan. I've showed you a lot of steps, a lot's going on here, but 
boil it down, take it a step at a time, just like I showed you, and then think about what does that one month plan look like? I'd say week by week, honestly. It's easier that way, that topical theme. What are the images? What videos will support it? What context are you writing about? And what is the timeline? Monday, Wednesday, Friday? You can look, there's certain times a day where there's the highest Instagram readership. You can look that up, not hard. So you might think, okay, let's post here and here. And when are you gonna be on Facebook posting? When do your tweets go out? Okay, that's the package. And then if you do a month, you can imagine as you get into the third week, it's time to get ready and launch that next month. So it takes work, but this would be, I would suggest the personal, the per, uh, most purposeful way to build a brand and then execute the messaging. Okay, so think about that. Okay, push marketing, we talked about this. this. You mass distribute messages, you wait and hope for an audience, right? We wanna get people to write back. I wanna bring you one last thing before I conclude. Let me take you into one last section. You may consider more lead generation. I've been learning about this, and again, I'm, I'm really impressed with it. I think it's important to take a look at lead generation, okay? This is paid. I'm not suggesting this, but you can go on LinkedIn and it'll walk you through and it'll help you create an ad and it'll give you all kinds of parameters, the type of person, okay? It will get you, and you know how it is, the LinkedIn stream comes and your messaging or ad will pop up and it will get you in front of X number of people. After that, I don't know what happens. You pay a certain cost for every one of the distributions and they'll tell you, we just got you in front of 10,000 people per your ad where you wanted to go. And I can't tell you what the response will be. Okay. I've tried it. I never got a high response, but Facebook will tell you. And by the way, what usually happens is you bid, you'll set a cost like 80 cents of you or something, and then you can cap it for the month. I only want to spend $80. But usually what happened with me and Facebook, they say, okay, your hundred dollars was spent. Your message has been sent out. I didn't get any ROI, return on investment. I did not get much coming back, okay? That's paid if you wanna to go to paid. Some people use it, LinkedIn would love you to spend some money with them. I don't know. Let me show you one other option, a little more deliberate, okay? Consider marketing automation. Marketing automation is where most companies are going now, especially with business to business. You are business to business when you're looking for contributors, when you're looking for donors, people who give money, corporations or grant givers, that's business to business, okay? There's several lead generator tools. I don't wanna promote one over the other, but I have some experience with one. So again, I'm saying it again, consider in kind. Does someone partner with you and help you at some of these lead generator firms or will a benefactor pay for the use of these? Okay, because it could be a big piece of your future business. Okay, this one's called Sharp Spring. The only reason I know, I come from University of Florida. That's where I got my PhD. I know students who have worked at Sharp Spring. They were really impressive. When they came out of there, they talk a completely different language. They, they think in a completely different way because they've been using the Sharp Spring tool for clients. Okay, so remember that Sharp Spring. Now, there's a whole system to it. They'll teach you how to use it, but it's everything in one, okay? They call it affordable. I'm gonna show you the price. You can tell me what you think. But here's the deal. They have massive, massive databases. I know they're operating in Africa because I did a little bit of research to see it as in Africa. It gives you the leads per month, and then it shows you how to move to convert those leads to sales. So leads to conversions to sales. So if you're working the system, and what if you got 12 new major givers a month? What would that do for your organization? Okay, it's very strategic. Okay, this is some of it from uh, Sharp Spring, how it works. I know someone I graduated from journalism school 30, 40 years ago. Here's what she does full time. She writes behavior-based emails. The language is absolutely psychologically constructed to get people to take action. 
okay? So Sharp Spring can help you because you want to be emailing back to the people in your lead set, okay? It will help you with the blogs. Remember we talked about blogs? Strategic language in your blog writing. Forms. Forms are those blanks where you want people to respond back, right? Give us your name. It strategically helps you build those forms to get the highest conversion. Okay, Sharp Spring Social. It helps you with your social media. So everything I've been trying to tell you today, these type of systems will help with landing pages. You may have heard of those. No more websites. You want to take pers people to an absolute place where they make a decision. So a landing page would be about where do they click to give you money. Okay, it will help you design landing pages. That's where you drive people for the conversions. Okay, customer relation management is if you've got 5,000 names you're working with, it helps you manage the leads inside those 5,000. Okay, this is one big system of marketing automation to get the results. Okay, not cheap. Okay, I realize this is where you would need a partner. But if you look at this, it's about the number of leads. If you want 1,500 contacts a month, 450 bucks US. 10,000 contacts a month, 650. So really what you're paying for is how many leads you get a month. Unlimited users, unlimited support, full set of features. So let's say you started with 1,500. You wanna work on 1,500 people qualified for you as potential givers. Then the system takes you through all 1,500. How many can you convert of that? 3%, 5%, that's sort of the number. So take five, three or 5% 5 of 1,500. If you can convert those to giving givers, that would be an advantage. You'll probably need a partner. Again, I'm not saying it's cheap. That's the type of service that's out there if you could find a partner to use it. Marketing automation. Okay, Sharp Spring and others, I found this, they give back, they do charitable work. I notice here they give back to the Florida community. They give to different charities. Now, I'm not suggesting all of you run after Sharp Spring and try to get funding. But my point is, these marketing automation companies do have charitable giving uh, actions. So there, there might be a partnership with other ones. I'm just saying these are opportunities to find partners that you could get to use this system. Okay, this is a company I found in South Africa and I noticed their partners with Sharp Spring. My point here is they're telling you a lot about the same process and information, but I wanted you to know, I wanted to make sure it does work in Africa. So. If this made sense, you'd have to be sure that the leads it's giving you are very good and specific for you, okay? So that's marketing automation, okay? It's a tough marketplace. I know that, it's tough. But yet there's these new opportunities, there's new tools, there's ways to do it smart, there's ways to be strategic, there's ways to make sure your brand is correct, okay? So you can be competitive but it's tough, it's just getting to the right tools. So I hope today, you know, in a little of this, here's my challenge to you. Build your most exceptional brand, then make sure you tell the right people about it. Yeah, I think if you're gonna look at platforms, Instagram is the big game right now. Instagram is really where it's at, it's visual, right? Everything has to be driven by an image. Surely for local or, you know, community building, I would drive everybody to Instagram. That would be my opinion. International, big donor, et cetera, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the business platform where, you know, you can find in executives. So LinkedIn's always going to be more business-minded, not consumer-oriented. Okay. So Instagram for the local community building, LinkedIn for the international benefactor building. Okay. Hello, I'm Tinashe from Zimbabwe. Hello. Uh, what if uh, if you are operating in a rural setting where your target uh, audience, they don't have uh, access to, to this social media, 
So how effective are these social media for someone uh, who is operating in a rural setting? Thank you. The answer is not very. It's not very effective. And, you know, I can go back four years to Mandela Fellows when we were still talking about no data, you know, no uh, Wi-Fi data, no data, and people were actually running generators to TV sets and showing people TV videos with generators, okay? It's a problem. Um, it seems over time more people have phones, more people have, you know, um, data that they can look at phones, but outside of it, it's not good. So then you're back to print and oral storytelling would be most important in communities. How can you gather people together? But you're correct. If people aren't connected, and that means connected into social media or having devices that work, I will be honest, it's not gonna have a high effect. You're gonna have to go back to community building and that's, you know, civic functions. Yeah, there, there's, there's no other good answer for that. And um, once again, when I started and said I wanted to have a disclaimer, I understand there's many different applications in different types of communities where this may make sense, but it might not for others. I would still suggest for any of you, even if your local community isn't highly wired, the benefactors to your organization will be. So you can still keep reaching outside your community to try to find that funding and revenue but it might not be reaching your local constituents. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Rebecca and I'm from Ghana. I don't have a question, but I'm just to say thank you so much for the presentation. And if there are no other questions, uh, I would suggest that you give us your last words and then we can conclude. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you for saying that. Uh, I think, I, I, you know, the last words are this, I'd, I'd be happy to help you. Uh, I want you to be successful in, in, you know, back to what I said, I know it's a tough business. I know I'm asking a lot in what I'm suggesting you do. But uh, if you want to be in this business, in the social media aspect of marketing and brand building, I believe in the steps I gave you are a good way to start. Um, and uh, that's a choice. You know, based on who you are, what you need to do, what you believe is best, those are all decisions you can make. But if you look at what I'll call today a plan, you can step through that. And uh, again, connect with social media, and I'd be happy to comment along the way if in the future weeks or months you uh, are working on these sort of plans. So for, with that, I'll thank you. Uh, I enjoyed the time, and I once again, I appreciate the privilege of being able to do this virtually because uh, I'm not able to be there. So thank you. Thank you. Very good.